good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church this morning. Beautiful day the Lord has given us. Let's take our my hymn book. Look at the screen on page 22. Are you washed in the blood? Let's all stand as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?
you're edified so far. Because that was good. That, that, that blessed my heart. Oh, it's good to be back with you, the people of God, this morning. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you for the second time uh, on the life of Abraham. Kind of a two-part uh, series that I started last week. And uh, then I'll be moving into 2 Peter next Sunday. A message that is really burning from my heart. But just good to be with you. Good to be with you. Uh, before I get started with the preaching in the morning, I just uh, would like to make you very conscious uh, to pray for uh, the police force uh, across the United States. We have a couple within our own congregation that uh, serve the community in that capacity, and we really need to pray for these dear folks. Um, uh, Granted, in, in any organization or group of people, you've got, you, you're always going to have some bad actors. I mean, that's the problem with uh, sinful human nature. And uh, it has caused a firestorm in the United States today. But uh, I, I want to go on record for anybody that's listening that I think it's an absolutely insane uh, to defund the police department. That's right. And that is getting some serious discussion across the United States. I, I tell you, if they ever do that, I'm going to look to move to another country because you're not going to want to be in America if they do that. Uh, I mean, you're just, you're really asking for probably even the people that are pushing to defund the police. Uh, if they have their way, they're not going to like the results of that either. So we need to pray for our country. We need to pray uh, for the police department. And uh, anytime things like this happen, they get painted with a broad brush, uh, unfortunately. Uh, that's not to say, as I mentioned before, I do recognize that in any organization, uh, you're going to have people that act unjustly, and they need to be held accountable like anybody else who does so. But we need to pray for the police department as a whole. I hope that you'll do that. Uh, in, in the weeks to come, particularly right now. The well, last week, we spoke to you about uh, the call of God to Abraham and the promise of God to Abraham, which came in the form of the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, I want to talk to you this morning about the struggles of Abraham, but it, it, it is connected with the, the title of the message from last week. If you recall... Uh, we entitled the series, The Demands of God Always Have Their Rewards. Uh, but those, those rewards come when we, when we take on the demands of God, obey the demands of God through faith and go forward. So to acquire the rewards and blessings uh, from God's top shelf, you will need to meet his demands. And to meet his demands, you will need a mature faith. So what lessons of faith did Abraham need to learn in order to have a faith that pleased God? And let me say, these lessons are very important for us to learn because if God is pleased, he will see to it that you're pleased as well. Do y'all believe that? And, and so uh, I think there's great value in seeing the lessons that Abraham learned uh, along the way, on the road of life, to bring him to the place of a, of a mature faith. And let me tell you what, folks, he became so strong in the faith that no one in Scripture is put on a higher pedestal in relation to faith than what Abraham is. I mean, you had great men of faith and, and women of faith in the Word of God, but uh, Abraham was more or less the patriarch, the father of faith among men. And uh, that's for good reason. It's because of the lessons that he learned along the way that developed, cultivated, and strengthened his faith. And the first thing that you see, and, and by the way, all these apply to us as well. But Abraham, first of all, had to learn to depend on God. 
So have y'all mastered that part of the equation yet? Have y'all learned to depend on God? Um, I think we, you know, by and large, I'm speaking to a fairly mature group uh, spiritually this morning. And I, I think we've learned a lot in regard to depending on God. We do it a lot more than, we, we're better at that than we used to be, hopefully. And I know you, uh, many of you folks pretty well, and I, I would say that is the case with you. But uh, I don't know that any of us have perfected that yet, do you? Depending on God, 100%. Uh, well, Abraham had to learn that as well. It's kind of interesting, some of the stories that you come up with and read when you're pre preparing for a message. This was kind of interesting to me. Uh, in the 1948 presidential election was one of the most shocking in the United States history. I don't know if you know why, uh, but uh, Harry Truman was the Democratic incumbent uh, having taken over after the death of uh, FDR. Franklin Roosevelt, but the Republican challenger, Thomas Dewey, was expected to win in a, lot, in a landslide, and Dewey was already acting like a winner. A New York uh, Times reporter wrote this. He said, Governor Dewey is acting like a man who has already been elected and is merely marking time waiting to take office. Dewey traveled the country as a confident man. He refused to deal with the key issues. He would not answer the attacks of his challenger. Nothing he thought could keep him from the White House. Even Truman expected to, lo to lose in the Gallup poll agreed. Election day finally rolled around. Truman retired to his room at uh, 6.30 and soon after that just went on off to sleep. He thought it was over. Well, the Chicago Tribune editor composed his headline, Dewey Defeats Truman, and closed up shop and went home. Then the impossible happened. Harry Truman won the election. Truman woke up at midnight. The radio, radio report still predicted his defeat, but early the next morning, a secret service agent uh, woke Truman up again. It now seemed that the greatest upset of all time was underway for Thomas Dewey. Uh, the shock was almost more than he could handle. And he began to recognize that overconfidence had done him in. And sometime after dawn, he went to bed a defeated man. And what's the point in saying all this? It, it, this is the point too often Believers behave like Thomas Dewey. We're just like that sometimes. We take our eyes off of God and go about our daily routine confident that we have everything under control. But again, I remind you, this world three months ago, maybe they thought they were in control too, and God barely lifted his little finger, and, and, and now the world's dealing with a pandemic, and it's come to a grinding halt. Yep. Let me tell you what, I mean, God can just turn everything around for the good or, or for worse in, in, in a split second. And man's not in control. Sovereign God is in control. And we need to realize that because uh, we can't depend upon ourselves. Things get out of our control sometimes, but they're never out of God's control. So it makes practical sense that we need to depend upon him rather than ourselves. Well, uh, specifically, Abraham needed to learn to depend on God for material needs. Upon entering Canaan, Abraham received God's assurance that he was in the promised land. In fact, in Genesis 12, 7, uh, uh, God said to Abraham, Under thy seed will I give the land. Almost immediately, however, there was a very severe famine that struck the land. We read in Genesis uh, 12, 10, for the famine was grievous in the land. So Abraham faced 
a real dilemma. Um, he was a newcomer to the land and he was unfamiliar with the techniques of, sur or, of surviving a Canaanite famine. Not only that, he was a traveling nomad as well who had to live on unclaimed land. So a Abraham could either choose to depend upon God in the midst of the famine or he could decide uh, to go down to Egypt and Genesis 12, 10 tells us what he decided to do. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. Instead of turning to God to care for his needs, Abraham ran from the scene of testing. But he would soon find that running was no solution. There would be even greater struggles ahead because of his decision not to depend upon God. Abraham needed to learn to depend on God also for personal safety. In the ancient world, a foreigner had few rights. Uh, neither his possessions nor his family were protected by law. Abraham knew that his wife Sarah was beautiful, and he was afraid that she would be taken away from him at the cost of his life. But instead of depending on God, Abraham demanded that Sarah lie and claim to be his sister. Now the truth is, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, but more than that, she was his wife. And I think you see what's going on here. So Abraham's actions were wrong. And why were they wrong? Because they revealed a lack of faith for God to take care of it. Y'all ever have that problem? I won't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. I've had that problem many times in my life. Concerned if God would and if he was able to take care of me in some pretty precarious situation. I got to tell you, though, and you know what? And unfortunately, being a human being, I probably have, there probably be another time in my life before I pass away when I have those same doubts. But I, I can tell you what you've already found out in life, because the same thing that I have found out, that in, the, in these difficult spots in life, when I have been between a rock and a hard place, God has always come through for Amen. me. Amen. Always. And if you're paying attention, he's doing that for you as well. If you just put your trust in him. Praise God, I mean, we can depend upon our God. But Abraham was still trying to learn that. So he goes down into Egypt, and uh, which brought the first crisis. You read about it in Genesis 12, verses 10 to 20. The Egyptians beheld Sarah that she was very fair. As it says there in verse 14, she was a very attractive lady. And Pharaoh took Sarah into his harem. This is not going well. This, this isn't going to end well either. You know, if God had not intervened and plagued, as the scripture says, Pharaoh and his house in verse 17, Abraham would have lost his wife bringing God's Promises to Abraham into jeopardy. I mean, that whole Abrahamic covenant was contingent upon the fact that Abraham would have a son by his wife Sarah. Was it not? I mean, the only thing that Abrahamic covenant God could have done was to give to Abraham a land. A lot, of, a lot of good that's going to do him when his lineage ends at his death. Now, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a whole nation of people. Too numerous for you to number. Well, I, I want to tell you what. Sarah's going to play a critical role in that. It would have been tragic had Abraham lost his wife. And you would think Abraham would have learned from that situation to depend upon God. I am hard-headed, just like Abraham seems to be in this particular situation. I mean, he has the problem.
problem with the Pharaoh in Egypt in Genesis tw chapter 12. You've only got to go eight chapters further into the book of Genesis to Genesis chapter 20. And, and, and he does the same thing all over again. The Philistine king Abimelech took Sarah. And it's a good thing here that God intervened because you know what? You can depend upon God. And God warned Abimelech in a dream to let this lady go. And he did. We should reflect upon Abraham's Egyptian experience. He ran from trouble, the famine in Canaan, and experienced even more trouble, the near loss of his wife. He then had to take up and return to Canaan again because it says in Genesis 12, verse 20, and going on from there, that they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had. Abraham would have been better off had he stayed in Can Canaan and trusted God in the first place. And how many times can we look back on our lives and say exactly the same thing? Where the choices before us uh, were of the choices we had, the one we should have taken was obvious. We should have always deferred to faith and depending on God. But no, we had to take matters into our own hands and suffer for it. We would have been better off doing it God's way in the first place. So Abraham's learning. You know what, folks? Before your faith can go from where it is to greater faith, you're going to have to learn that lesson even better than you know it right now. And so am I. You see, you may have a fairly good faith right now. Your, your level of faith is fairly good. But you only depend upon God, hypothetically, say 80% of the time. What might happen if you can bump that up to 90% of the time? What might happen if you bump that up to 100% of the time? Because I, I, I've got to believe if we could do that, God would unleash such blessings upon our lives beyond anything that we have ever imagined up until this point. Whatever level of faith we are at right now, it's still not good enough. Unless you're depending on God 100% of the time, every day of every year. I've got a feeling we've all got some work yet to do. To be sure, I have. Second thing. Abraham had to learn how to handle strife and division. And believe it or not, that, that is connected uh, to the strength of your faith. Sometimes we let people get us all out of sorts and we respond in the wrong way. We become angry, we become bitter, we become critical. And the reason why we do that is because when we're under attack, we feel insecure. If we had faith in God, if we depended upon God 100% of the time, we would not have those feelings of insecurity. Does that make, am I making sense? Apparently not. Yes. yes, I heard that. Yeah, from the balcony. Thank you. Right now I'm feeling very insecure. I need some reassurance that you think I'm on the right track. See, I'm still growing too, but it was, he had to learn how to handle strife and division. You know, Abraham's refusal to leave Lot behind in the Ur of the Cal well, rather in Haran, soon led to problems. The, uh, the, the two experienced friction because their grazing land was not sufficient uh, for their flocks and herds, the grazing land that they were sharing. So they would have to split up. But this time, and you can see that Abraham's making progress, 
This time, Abraham responded in the proper way. He recognized that the best way to solve strife is with unselfishness. I, uh, I can say a boatload about selfishness. I have a lot of experience in this particular subject. I was born an only child, man. I got that working against me. Uh, man, when Christmas came around, I was endowed with gifts. It was, and I tell you what, man, on Christmas morning, it's wonderful being an only child. Because when you see those gifts spread all around the room, you know they're all for you and not some brother or sister. Pouring in. Uh, you know, I, I guess I believe that the, the worst, this is just, I don't know, the way I view scripture, I, I may be totally wrong here. I used to say that, you know, pride was at the root of all sin. I mean, that's what caused Adam and Eve to, well, particularly Eve, to fall in the garden. But I think right there with pride, there needs to be something said about selfishness. That's almost at the root of every sin. I mean, Eve was being selfish. She, she thought that she partook of the fruit, she could be like God. Yeah, that's pride, but there's selfishness too. It's like, you know, hey, I want to be exalted. I don't care about the rest of you, but how about me? But this time, Abraham does it right, and he's very unselfish. He allows Lot to choose the grazing land that he preferred, and uh, Lot chose the best for himself, the well-watered plain of Jordan. But this is the great thing. Abraham didn't worry about that. We would get upset over that. How many families have been split up when mom... When, when, the survive, when, the, when the last surviving parent passes away and, the, the, you know, the will is contested, it, it's a sad thing to see siblings fighting over material goods and money. And this happens all the time, even among Christian families. You know what it is? It's just plain old selfishness. Money means too much to too many of God's people. And, uh, but Abraham didn't worry about it. He had a peacemaking spirit preferring to suffer personal loss rather than to allow strife to continue. Are you willing to do that as well? If you're a person of faith, you would. God appeared to Abraham and rewarded him richly, promising to give him all the land, all the land to his descendants. You know, God loves selfless believers. No, I mean, he really does. He sits up and takes notice of that. Those who respond to strife with a giving spirit and prefer harmony rather than gain. As Paul wrote in Romans 12, 18, he said, If it be possible as much as life in you, peaceably live, uh, live peaceably with all men. So this is the wisdom that faith teaches you. If you'll just turn your life over to God, instead of just grabbing for everything you can get, if you just trust God, you'll end up with much more that way than had you taken matters into your own hands. God honored and blessed Abraham for being unselfish. And you're going to see this again in just a moment. Abraham was not trusting uh, in his possessions to give him the blessings in life that he needed. He was learning to trust in God for that. 
And that is a great lesson that, that we need to embrace from the heart this morning. There's a third thing. All right, I've been machine gunning. Are y'all still there? It's morning. Uh, li listen to this lesson. Abraham, Abraham had to learn how to return good for evil. So how are we doing with that? He had to learn how to return good for evil. Humanly speaking, Abraham had every right to be bitter toward Lot, did he not? And I think some of us would struggle with bitterness had we been put in that same situation. I mean, Lot had just ripped Abraham off and taken the best land for himself, and no one would blame Abraham for rejecting Lot entirely, for refusing to intervene at all on his behalf, but Abraham was not a vengeful man. And uh, again and again, we see Abraham returning good for evil. Now you see in Genesis chapter 14 that Abraham rescued Lot. Here again, Lot that ripped him off. Uh, five kings invaded the five cities of the plain, capturing Lot in the process. We see that in Genesis 14, verses 1 to 12. And Abraham soon learned of his nephew's fate, and so together with 318 of his servants and his allies, he conquered the kings and delivered Lot. And then in Genesis 18, verses 16 to 33, Abraham interceded for Lot. God revealed to Abraham his plans to destroy Sodom, and so Abraham prayed that God would spare the city for Lot's sake. You may sit back at this moment and say, well, okay, that's just it's so much preaching. Once again, but are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, would, would, you, would you pay that kind of a price for someone who tried to rip you off and, and to bring harm to you? basically. But Abraham said, I'm not, I'm not going. I'm not going there. I'm going to God instead. I'm going to do the right thing and let God take care of the results. Well, of course, God was forced to judge Sodom. He couldn't, because he couldn't find ten righteous people there. But for Abraham's sake, God delivered Lot. You see that in Genesis 19. You know, folks, let me tell you what faith teaches you. Faith teaches you that God condemns a vengeful spirit. Do you have a vengeful spirit this morning? Is there anyone that you would like to bring harm to? Anyone upon this earth today? Leviticus 19.18 says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge. Do any of you have a grudge toward a brother or sister in this church family? Do you have a grudge against me? Proverbs 24.29 says, Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. Matthew 5, 44 says, Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. 1 Peter 3, 9 says, Not rendering evil for evil. Believers are to return good for evil, thus gaining an opportunity to witness and win the loss. And that's what faith teaches us. Are we learning the lessons of faith? Abraham is. The fourth lesson he had to learn was how to refuse earthly gain. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. So the scripture tells us right away that uh, greed absolutely destroys. But love for money remains as a common temptation among God's people. Um, 
Now, this is the thing that you see in the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham defeats these five kings. Uh, he brings with him the spoils of war. And uh, in chapter 14, verses 21 to 24, this is what we read. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So the king of Sodom says to Abraham, just give me your prisoners. You can take all the spoils of war and keep them for yourselves, for yourself. And Abram said unto the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men, young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Again, his victory over the invading kings, Abraham could have taken everything that he wished. But uh, the king of Sodom said, again, give me the persons and take the goods. Abraham refused. And you know why? He said, I don't need it. I serve the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. What are a few spoils of war when my father in heaven owns it all? We don't forget that, do we? He owns it all. Maybe you'd like, if you come up against financial hardship, you'd like some friend to, I don't know, give you some money or something. Maybe you'd like a, a rich uncle to pass away and leave you in his will. I don't know. But I hope we haven't forgotten that our Heavenly Father owns it all. Right. And that we can go to Him in prayer. And uh, we need to be reminded of what the Scripture says. Jesus told us, He said, look, go to Him in prayer. The writer of Hebrews says, you know, He's already aware of everything you're going through, so go to His throne in boldness in the time of need. And Jesus said, you know what? Hey, you, you have not because you ask not or because you ask amiss to consume it upon your own lust. But if you've got a legitimate need, not something you're lusting for, but you've got a genuine need, Jesus said, God, you're, you're living for God? Jesus said, God's already promised you, my friend, that he will hear your prayer and answer You don't, need, you don't need help from somebody else. Now, God may lay it on the heart of somebody else to help you. That's different. That's in response to your prayer. But it's God we seek. It's not the wealth of others. And Abraham was learning this. You can, you can see his faith increasing in God. It was, it was Abraham's attitude that said in so many words that God's blessings were all that he needed. All right, let me check in again. How do y'all feel about that? Do you need anything more than what God wants to give you? We don't. We think we do, but we don't. Well, we come to a fifth lesson. Abraham had to learn how to wait for God's timing. He had to learn how to wait for God's timing. Faith does that. Um, John Adams, of course, was the second president of the United States. His life was a, a distinguished one. But Adams almost got sidetracked along the way. As a boy, Adams found Latin to be boring. 
Well, I can't blame him for that. I took two or three years of it in high school, and I, I found it to be boring as well. I had a teacher named Mrs. Winger, and she was from the old school of teaching. A dear elderly lady, kind of heavy set, had her hair woven, it was always woven in a circle on top, it looked almost like a beehive on, on her head. And I remember Miss Winger well. It reminds you of some lady you'd see in one of these British films with all these ugly people, you know. Do they have attractive people over there in Great Britain? Hope nobody in Great Britain is viewing this on Facebook today. I, it seems like when you get these PBS films or BBC films, they, they, they look for the ugliest people they can find to What has that got to do with the message? Yeah, I, I know. I, what, where am I going with all this? I have no idea. But I know when the, uh, the Latin class, because we were all bored stiff, when it got a little bit unruly, the classic Mrs. Winger, and she was a wonderful lady, but you know what she would say? <laughs> Uh, I feel like a sissy even repeating it. She'd say, up, soup, my little chickenies. What? I'm a cool high school kid, man. I play on a football team. Don't up, soup me. I'm no chickadee. But anyway, up, soup, my little chickadee. Well, anyway, John Adams was bored to death with Latin and uh, asked his father if he could be excused from it. To which his father replied, well, John, if Latin grammar doesn't suit you, you may try ditching, digging ditches. Perhaps that will suit you. My meadow, my meadow yonder needs a ditch. Well, two days later, John was back in Latin. At 15, he entered Harvard College. A few years later, John was struggling to pass his law exams, and it was then that John's tutor, Jeremiah Gridley, gave him some very helpful advice. This, this is what Gridley said, quote, an early marriage will probably put an end to your studies and, and, and will certainly involve you in expense. Because John Adams had his eye on a young lady who wanted to get married. But John took the admonition to wait and threw himself into his studies and became a very successful lawyer and the rest is history. But these are some of the little minor details that, we don't, all, that don't always surface. That man's advice made all the difference in John Adams' life, the advice to wait. And successful men and women learn to wait. The problem with being young is that when you want something, you want it yesterday. You don't want to wait. You don't want to pay the price of achievement. Uh, successful people, they know not to quit school because they want to get out on their own. They know not to marry young because they want companionship. Successful believers must learn to wait for God's timing as well. And this test was especially tough for Abraham because God had promised to Abraham a son, and yet he and his wife were getting older every day. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know what? It's... It's when you wait that sometimes you gain strength and power. Just waiting on the Lord. You know, sometimes you come to God exhausted, and you know what God says to do is, hey, wait and renew your strength. Renew your strength, your inner strength that you find in me, your relationship with me. Well, Abraham was getting older. However, this is where God's going to teach him to wait on him and Abraham initially went from doubt to faith that's good 
because he has been making progress in his faith. In Genesis 15, 2, it says, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And in verse 3, uh, he says, to me thou hast given no seed. So God simply renewed his promise. And Abraham's descendants, according to God in verse 5, would be as numberless as the stars in heaven. So the doubts fan, uh, vanished and Abraham believed in the Lord, it says in verse 6. But later, Abraham went from doubt to sin. His faith faltered a little bit. His faith was unwilling to wait on God any longer. And so the years passed, no son came. Abraham was now 85 and Sarah was 75, well beyond the years of childbearing. And uh, under normal circumstances, at least. A sense of hopelessness set in, according to Genesis 16, verses 1 to 4. So Abraham and Sarah jumped ahead of the will of God. You know the story all too well. And they, they thought they needed to help God fulfill his promise to them. You don't need to help God. God's got all the power that he needs already. But anyway, Sarah gave her handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham. And Hagar conceived and bore Ishmael. Abraham's actions were socially acceptable, by the way, in ancient Near Eastern culture. If a marriage relationship didn't produce a child, the wife could give a servant to her husband in hopes that his union would produce children. Now, an actual, a, a, a legal marriage actually takes place here. But the new wife was to be a concubine rather than a surrogate mother. In other words, she lacked the full rights and privileges of the primary wife, in this case, Sarah. But you know what? Acceptance with men, though it was accepted by the society of the day, doesn't mean it's accepted by God. And God had promised a child to Abraham and Sarah. And he expected them to wait on him. Thankfully, Abraham goes later from doubt to faith once again. So, after his struggles with faith, now 14 years more had passed. Abraham was now 99. Sarah was 89 on the verge of turning 90. And God appeared and renewed his promise that Abraham would have a son. He says in, uh, I believe it's uh, Genesis 17, verse 16, I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Now, you know, Abraham struggled at the words. His faith is still growing. And he starts laughing. He fell before God in verse 17 and declared, Sarah, shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? But doubts turned into faith as uh, Abraham obeyed God and submitted to God's command for circumcision that you see later in verses 23 and 27. Two more lessons that we're done, and these are, will go quickly. The sixth thing that Abraham had to learn, that he had to learn from his faith, concerning faith, he had to learn how to deal with tempting pleas. Several times, Sarah tempted Abraham to do wrong. You know to what I refer, right? He tempts him to do wrong. Abraham loved his wife, of course, but occasionally he didn't have the strength to stand up to her. He surrendered to her pressures in Genesis 16, first by marrying Hagar, and then by giving Sarah permission to mistreat Hagar. He refused, however, to intervene in Genesis 21, verses 8 to 20, when Sarah asked for permission to send Hagar and Ishmael away, but God solved Abraham's dilemma there by commanding that uh, he send them away anyway. But Abraham wasn't going to have any part of it. 
his willingness to go along with Sarah's desire, desires evidence to severe weakness in his life. You know, sometimes those that are very close to you may want you to go against what you know to be the clear will of God for your life. And that will put a lot of pressure on you. You love these people. But folks, when it comes right down to it, Jesus said, if you love your father or mother more than me or your brother and sister more than me, you're, just, you're not worthy of me. To, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And when God reveals his will to you, and it may be to go to the other end of the, the other side of the globe to be a missionary, and yet mom and dad don't want you to do that. Brother and sister don't want you to do that. It doesn't matter. Faith tells you to depend on God and trust in his will and above all, obey him even when it may cost you. Do you have that kind of faith? Will you obey him when it costs you much? The last lesson Abraham needed to learn was to how to give God first place in his life. And again, I want to ask the question, have we learned that lesson yet? I know you're tired. Maybe I, maybe your attention span is shot at this particular point. You've been listening to me long enough. But if you could just tune in one last time, I want to ask you, has your faith taught you to put God first place in your life? I really want you to think about that right now. Would you do whatever God told you to do? Even if you're tired, even if it inconvenienced you, even if it caused a sacrifice and hurt in your life, would you obey simply because he is your master above all other masters? Abraham had to learn this one last lesson. To be the father of faith. The evangelist Judson W. Van Deventer, don't ask me to say that ten times real fast, by the way. But he struggled with God over the control of his life. Who would take who would take first place? Van Deventer or God? For years he wanted to be an artist. He got the needed education, studying under a famous German teacher. He began to teach art in public schools while sharpening his skills, but God was demanding something else. Van de Venter said, the Spirit of God was strongly urging me to give up teaching and to enter the evangelistic field, but I would not yield. I still had the burning desire to be an artist. This battle raged for five years. At last, the time came when I could hold out no longer, and I surrendered all my life and my talents. It was then that a new day ushered into my life. Looking back on that day, Van de Venter penned the hymn, I Surrender All. He had given everything to Christ and he never regretted his decision and neither will you and neither will I. In Genesis 22 verses 1 to 19, Abraham experienced his most difficult test. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, now is the moment of truth. Now we will find out how far Abraham's faith has come. And God will put you to the test at some time along the way to, to find out the same. His son Isaac had been born and had grown into a young man. Josephus, the Jewish historian, I don't know where he gets his information, but he, he says that uh, Isaac was 25 years old at this particular time. 
this juncture, God appeared. And Abraham must offer his son as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. Really? This time, however, this is remarkable. Abraham did not waver. Do y'all find that remarkable? What if God asks the same of you? He got up, as it says in verse 3 in Genesis 22, early in the morning, and he headed out for the place of sacrifice. He and Isaac finally arrived and climbed the mountain together. And there he bound his son and prepared to drive a knife into his heart. How could Abraham do such a thing? I'll tell you how. Abraham trusted God to raise his son from the dead if necessary. For it says in verse 5, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Isaac and I, he said to his servant, we will be back again to rejoin you. Fifty years earlier, Abraham could never have withstood such a test, but the years of testing had brought his faith to maturity. That's why we need those trials in our lives that I've been preaching about. God now had first place in his life, and even more important than his long, uh, and that faith was even more important than his long-awaited cherished son. God's will was all that really mattered now to Abraham. And God's power was all that he really needed. Well, of course, God intervened and spared Isaac's life. And God gave testimony to Abraham's faith. And here I am done. But man, you've got to see this in verse 12. He, God said, now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son from me. Now I know, God said. What does God know about your faith? Is it rock solid? Is it unfaltering? Can it stand the test of time? My friends, you and I will know when our faith has arrived and we're willing to give our lives and all that we hold dear back to God. How far have you come by faith? this day. Let's pray. Father, I would pray this morning, as has been prayed before, that you would increase our faith. Lord, it's obvious from the study of Scripture, from the past experiences of life, that when we live our lives on the basis of faith, life is much easier. It still maintains its struggles and trials, but with a firm trust and reliance upon our Heavenly Father, these trials are so much easier to bear. Lord, if we are, if we are found deficient in this way this morning, then Father, work now by the applied Word of God, applied by the Holy Spirit. Father, work now in our hearts to bring us to a place of increased faith. Because we know, as the writer of Hebrews says, it's faith that pleases God. And Lord, I believe your people here want to please you today. So Father, help us to be strong in faith, that we might be a shining light and testimony to a world that's lost its way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I would like for us to stand and sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you need to speak to the Lord today, there's room at this altar. But if you've got your eyes on the circumstances of the world, you, you need to get them back upon the Lord Jesus Christ today. Let's lift it up on that first stanza, all right?
him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.